Welcome, sir. Welcome to the Rising India Summit. A huge round of applause. And he will be in conversation with Shweta Punch. Take it away, Shweta. Thank you, Chandra. A very warm welcome, Mr. Puri. It's an honor for us to host you here at uh, Rising India. Mr. Puri, of course, needs no introduction. I'd just like to add that besides being an ace administrator, a former diplomat, a cabinet minister, he's also the longest serving urban and housing, urban affairs and housing minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here today on a very auspicious day. And I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you a very, very happy Ram Naomi. A very you know, happy Ram Naomi. I also believe that uh, after 496 years, the temple where Lord Ram was born, Ram Janma Bhuni, me, will be ready. And next year, these Ram Naomi celebrations will be in Ayodhya. And I hope your channel covers them then. Well, that's a very, very heartening note, sir, to begin the conversation with. Thank you. Wonderful. You're absolutely right. There is uh, urban renewal, and the kind of work that we are seeing in this space has, never been, has not been witnessed in India for a very, very long time. I want to begin by asking you, what is the messaging that India wants to give out to the world as it undertakes this massive urban renewal across cities? What is the thought process behind it? I think more than the messaging to the world, there is a ground reality on what is happening. Let me start by saying that between 1947, when the urban population was about 17 percent, and uh, the total population of India was, I think, what, 350 million, to the time that the Honorable Prime Minister assumed responsibility, I'm speaking of May 2014, the urban space was subjected to what can only be described as neglect. In some of my harsher moments, I have used the word that that neglect was criminal. And for whatever reason, I think it best comes out, not only because the Honorable Prime Minister has been able to uh, bring about a transformative change, but the figures show that. And whether it's the Ram Temple, Ram Janma Mubi, the temple after 496 years, or what's happening in the urban space. Let me give you one or two sets of statistics which I think capture this. Absolutely. The total housing built in the 10 years between 2004 and 2014 total number was 13.46 lakhs in their affordable housing segment, Pradhan Mantri of Avas Yojana equivalent. From those 13 lakhs in the eight years of the Modi government, it has gone up to 1.22 crores, nine times higher. Well, can we get a round of applause for that? I think that's really... The total no. investment in housing was, in those 10 years of the UPA government, 20,303 crores. In the eight years of the Modi government, it's two lakh plus crores. Again, it's 10 times higher. The total, I'll, sk I'll spare you the other details, but the total urban spend, which is all the central schemes put together in those 10 years, was 1 lakh 57 lakh, 1.57 lakh crores. And it has gone now to over 17 lakh crores, so eight times higher. This is because the urban space is now receiving the kind of attention which it needed earlier. Mm -hmm. I can give you the same in terms of urban uh, transport, the metro system. It started in Mr. Vajpayee's time from zero. Mm -hmm. In uh, 2014, the total kilometrage was... Um, 229 kilometers. 
Today we have 850 kilometers of metro operational and 1050 kilometers under construction. We are the fifth largest metro system in the world. In a few months time we'll be the third largest and by the end of next year right. we will be the second largest after China. We will, we will even replace the United States which is at 1056 kilometers. We are very close to that. So this is the kind of work which is being done and I think it all starts with the kind of fo focus on urban rejuvenation which the yes. Honorable Prime Minister brought in May 2014. That is reflecting in the work which is being done in all the schemes which are cooperative federal schemes. Right. So Mr. Puri, we are looking at reimagining a lot of historical sites. You started by saying that next Ram Naomi we will be celebrating at the Ayodhya Ram Temple. We are uh, redesigning 6,000 year old cities. How are you ensuring that heritage marries the contemporary architecture that India is looking at introducing right now? How are you maintaining that balance? See, I can answer your question either in a general philosophical way, and I see many more um, educated and enlightened people who do a better job than me on that, but let me give you some examples. We are a 5,000 or plus year old civilization. We are only a 75 year old country. When we became an independent country, we inherited colonial heritage, historically important buildings, forts, uh, temples going back hundreds and thousands of years. Clearly the answer to that lies in being able to take that historical and cultural legacy mm -hmm. and build in the modern element. Let me start with the Central Vista. It provides an, a good example with which many of your um, invitees here would be familiar. The work on the Rashtrapati Bhavan, North Block, South Block, the Parliament Building, let me take the Parliament Building. If I remember correctly, the conceptualization of it started probably around 1916. Thereabout, it was built about in 1921 or so. It was never intended to be the legislature of an independent country. Independence was not in the minds of the colonial power when they designed that governing architecture. They right. thought that this would serve the purpose of a colonial administration and have an imperial you know, legislature, whatever mm -hmm. they needed. We became independent in 1947. Why is it that it took up till 2014 and only after 2014 when the Honorable Prime Minister arrives on the scene that attention is devoted to refurbishing? No old building will come down. The old parliament will So you will did remain. face a lot of flack on the Central Vista project. There, were, there was concerns uh, raised on whether heritage buildings will be hurt. Would you like to say something or to I allay can, those concerns? I can tell you that I want to thank you for asking this question. Not a single heritage building will be brought down. Nothing which is of, you know, enduring historical value. And I'm not trying to uh, qualify that statement. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we are a robust democracy, a very vibrant one. We are also now pretty uh, good at the art of what is called the false narrative. Right. So when we were redesigning the Kartavya path, mm -hmm. you know, what was it? It was called the Raj path. Yes. The terminology, the terminology also reflects a colonial mindset. And I was subjected to some very interesting criticism. It said, ki pe green cover had jayega. Jamun trees, which are there, will be removed. So, the fact of the matter is, and I said it then, today that criticism is conspicuous by its absence. There's not a single voice which says that. I kept saying that the green cover will be increased three times. The water bodies will be enlarged. You know, at one point, no one could access the area beyond the outer water body. And I think the proof of the pudding, as they say in the English language, mm -hmm. is look at the kind of 
reception that has received. Equally, all the other components, we were paying 1,000 crores, we still are, by way of rent for government to be housed, the offices of government to be housed. Right. And some of the construction which took place in the 1960s, you know, one of the buildings in which one of my ministries is situated, I don't know where the architectural or design inspiration came for those. But you know, the fact of the matter is there's no parking, there's no space, they're, they're, they're like, um, I don't like using the word slums because I always prefer calling them informal settlements, but these are really urban slums. So you'll have instead of that new buildings, modern, well-lit, using sure. the best of technology, airy, a more conducive working environment, mm -hmm. and it's all work which is taking place right now. I want to sw switch gears a little bit from urban planning uh, to a little bit of politics. To? To politics, since uh, we're running out of time. I want to uh, ask you about, uh, you know, what Mr. Gandhi has been saying. He's been playing the victim card. And uh, we had Mr. Amit Shah here yesterday, who, who spoke about how he was interrogated by federal investigators, and he was being forced to name Prime Minister Modi as one of the key conspirators. So I want, I want to get a reaction from you on how do you view you know, Mr. Mr. Gandhi's politics, whether it is his comments on Mr. Savarkar or it is him undermining India's democracy when he's visiting abroad or it is him playing the victim card. Let me position myself in response to that, um, if I may say, um, a very inviting, slightly provocative question. And let me respond to that by separating the different components. Everyone, no matter where he or she is born, is influenced by the kind of uh, you know, DNA you come with, the kind of uh, nurturing you receive in terms of um, the setting that you are made to grow up. Some of us are made to work very hard as part of our upbringing. We have to earn our living, etc. And many more people are perhaps more fortunate. They have, um, and that results in a sense of entitlement. I'm not going to say on what A said or B said. I'll come to what Mr. Shah said, and I fully empathize, and I think he's making a very, very, very important point. But let me say that a comment made by any Indian politician about Veer Savarkarji. Let me come to that. Look, I'm a student of history, and what I know from my study of Indian history is that a lot of people made outstanding contributions. They made sacrifices of a very high order, and Veer Savarkarji was one of them. He's probably mm -hmm. going to be in any listing that you attempt. He'll be right at the top of that listing sentenced to life imprisonment, okay? Now, to compare yourself in terms of what Savarkarji's contribution is, and by the way, I'm married to a Maharashtrian, so I, that sentiment runs even deeper in the state of Maharashtra. It, it resonates with all of us. I'm not surprised at the reaction that has taken place, including from the so-called allies of the Congress party. They've all taken exception to those comments. I was also asked a question on this and I said, uh, wait a minute, uh, and I, I made a comment. Uh, I stand by that comment. But let me come to what exactly is the issue we are discussing today. In a statement which is in the public domain, the young leader, not so young, he's past 50, said he named three members of one community. Mr. Nirav Modi, Mr. Um, um, you know, Lalit Modi, and he named the Honorable Prime Minister. And then he went on to make the astonishing statement that if you look for other people with that name, you'll find many more XYZs there. I find, found that uh, unbelievable. But a particular member of that community sought recourse 
through the judicial process and the gentleman has been convicted by a court. So the recourse to that lies through appealing to that and getting a stay. It is a very simple uh, solution. You can turn around, you could have said before the uh, presiding uh, judge that I'm sorry, um, I didn't mean it, etc. But instead what you are witnessing is uh, uh, black uh, attired fashion shows. Uh, you are witnessing uh, other fine uh, forms of melodramatics. Now, is he the first Indian politician to have been disqualified through, um, from membership through a action which has come through the courts? I don't think so. I, the figure I may not have, somebody mentioned 12, I think it's 17. 17 people have been so disqualified. Right. Now, the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, these are all important segments in a democracy. And his disqualification as a member of the House came as part of that. There is no discretion exercise there. Sure. If you are disqualified uh, by a court, and there is a long drama about that ordinance which was torn. Mm -hmm. I was uh, serving as an ambassador outside, and I saw the face, uh, look on the face of the then Prime Minister when the press uh, report said that the gentleman had torn uh, an ordinance which they had been passed by the cabinet. Now, my answer to that is that um, this is a politics, a course of action, where I would some say very low-level di discourse, mm -hmm. where they're seeking to pursue. Right. I have very clear views on that, and I think the people of India will, they have rejected it. Now, to go outside the country, now India is rising. I think your, um, that's also the broad rising theme, India, rising yes. India. Yes. Are people happy about the rising India? I think people in India are very happy about the rising India. People outside are happy about the rising India. But some people right. don't, are not that appreciative. They have their other thing. Now you to appeal to them and get them to comment on this, I find this, frankly, juvenile. Juvenile. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Puri. It was a pleasure speaking with you. We've run out of time. I'll hand it over to Chandra. Thank you very much, Mr. Puri. Some amazing insights on the urban side and a lot of headlines on politics as well. I would like to request you to stay back on stage, sir, because we would like to request you to felicitate the real heroes from the field of innovation. Thank you, Shweta, for moderating the session. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at the first winner in this category.